Good afternoon, folks. My name is Calvin Modi. I'm the youth liaison here at the White House. Uh, we're joined today by USAID Administrator uh, Dr. Rod Shah uh, for a web chat uh, the series How to Make Change with Young Americans on International Aid and Development uh, and Poverty. Uh, so for folks that are joining online, uh, you can go to whitehouse. I'm sorry, facebook.com slash whitehouse, uh, or if you're watching, whitehouse.gov slash live. Uh, to submit your questions. We've also got folks uh, submitting questions on Twitter, uh, and some of you already sent in your questions uh, in advance via, via email and Twitter. So we'll get to all of those. We're also joined by a bunch of great young folks in the room, so we'll get to some of your questions today. Uh, we'll also continue the conversation at whitehouse.gov slash youngamericans afterwards, uh, where we'll upload a video of this. So if you've got friends who want to join, don't have the time to, you can always direct them there later. But uh, Dr. Shah, let me turn it over to you and, and have you make some introductory remarks. Well, thank you, Calvin, and thank you, everybody, for joining and being here in person and online. Uh, it, this is very exciting. And it's exciting because, you know, young people understand something that many older generations uh, don't quite get uh, just as naturally and as instinctively. And that is that, that, that our world is now fully interconnected and that we have the power to help people around the world lead better lives. And in doing so, we have the power to really, literally craft the kind of world we want to live in in the future, one that is peaceful and prosperous, where trade and, and cultural engagement replace war and famine and drought as the conditions that define our existence. And I am so excited to be with you today because the fact that young people around this country are oversubscribing college classes on global health and global development is inspiring to all of us. The fact that there are students, including some in the room, that are at MIT that are out in uh, countries designing new forms of solar-powered lighting for villages that don't have grid-based electricity is an outstanding thing. And the fact that students on the other coast have developed websites that help you send a small loan to partners around the world, maybe uh, a small entrepreneur or something like that, is really very exciting. And so I hope to hear your questions and have the chance to, to learn from you. I believe we're in this era of development results that never before has the technology and know-how and enthusiasm existed to really solve major global problems. Just a few weeks ago, the Obama administration announced a major commitment to get new vaccines for pneumonia and diarrhea out throughout the world to every child, no matter where they're born. And that simple act, of doing that one thing will help save more than four million children's lives over the next five years. And our administration is proud to be a part of it. We live in an era when by simply getting an insecticide-treated bed net to kids to sleep under in sub-Saharan Africa and doing a few other things, we can virtually eliminate malaria as a cause of child death within five to seven years. And that would save 700,000 children a year from dying unnecessarily as a kid. There are examples like this in every field that we work in, in global health and in global development. And, and in order for us to be successful, we will need the energy and the enthusiasm, the creativity and the innovation of America's young people to literally create the new solutions that can help bring power to the 1.4 billion people that live in the dark or help address famine and hunger that is currently rearing its ugly head again in the Horn of Africa where a drought now threatens more than two million people and their access to basic food, water, and security. So I'm excited to be in this conversation with you. I want to learn from you and, uh, and thank you for having me here. Thank you. So we've got a bunch of great questions. I'm going to take the first one from Facebook. Uh, Howard uh, Hojo Kapon wants to know, in terms of aid, what is the U.S. doing to encourage impoverished localities to become self-sufficient? Well, you know, we've, we've done a lot, and President Obama has made self-sufficiency the main focus of our assistance work around the world. So I'll take food as an example, where the President launched an initiative called Feed the Future, and it's designed to really help address the fact that for the first time in decades, over the last three or four years, People have, the number of people who go to bed hungry every night around the world has actually gone up. And it went up in 2008 for the first time in three and a half decades because food prices went up. And the instinctive reaction is when people go hungry, we should feed them. 
And in fact, we do. The United States is the largest, fastest, most important humanitarian partner to those facing acute starvation. But the smart answer is to invest in self-sufficiency, to help countries have road access and agricultural marketing systems, to have American scientists partner with their African or Asian counterparts to usher in a revolution in food production based on new technologies and new, new approaches to food production and based on targeting young kids and getting them the adequate nutrition they need, especially in the critical first two years of life. And so we've launched this effort, Feed the Future. We target uh, helping 18 million people move out of a condition of poverty and hunger through agricultural development, including helping 7 million kids uh, improve their nutrition status so they're not chronically malnourished. We think this is achievable. We've asked the countries that have partnered with us to do more themselves as a condition of receiving American assistance. And, uh, and we'd love to have more young people around this country on college campuses engaged in Feed the Future. You can engage with us by going to usaid.gov slash youthimpact and signing up to be part of the team. And, and we just really uh, are optimistic about what can happen when we focus on self-sufficiency in addition to dealing with the acute needs when people are literally starving. So you, you touched on the aspect of accountability. We have a couple of questions coming in um, from uh, Jimmy Mertoon and uh, Graham Davis, among others. Uh, Graham's question provides a little more context in his own travels. He says, if USA had these policies to write huge checks for governments or NGOs in the developing world, what guarantee do the US taxpayers have that money is going where it needs to go, particularly to youth? Uh, he says, I just returned from Liberia, West Africa, and US foreign policy is failing there. Money isn't getting to where it needs to go, uh, and things are getting more polarized. Well, it's a great question, and when I started, uh, I asked that exact same question and, uh, to our team, and we put in place a set of reforms we call USA Forward, designed to improve the accountability and help us learn from uh, every dollar that we invest in helping to make the world a better place. So as of this year, for every new project we invest in, we will have an independent project evaluation, and that results of that evaluation will be publicly posted on our website within three months of project completion. It'll take a few years for that to phase in, but once it does, you know, every single program that's conducted that's of significant size and scope will, will essentially be a learning opportunity for us to learn about how to do this better and more efficiently. And those types of learning opportunities do generate real results. I'll give you one example. In Africa, over the last five years, we've launched a really expanded malaria program. And that program has seen, based on validated evaluation data, a 30 plus percent reduction in kids under five dying in countries that have expanded access to the program. And the program basically helps kids get insecticide treated bed nets, uh, malaria combination drugs, and spraying with, insecti with safe insecticides and pesticides for their homes. And in mosquito-laden villages, that helps save kids' lives, and it does so at a few dollars per life year. So it is pretty much the best investment you can make. And those are the kinds of things we want to do more of, efficient ways to save lives and make the world a better place. Why don't we take a question from someone in the room? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Actually, Phil. wait one second. We're going to give you microphones to come from here. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Phil Arnion, and I work at 350.org. We work with uh, youth around the world who are focused on climate change, which, as you know, is a really important issue in terms of poverty alleviation. Um, the science is getting worse, and we know that climate change uh, has the ability to wipe out development gains that we've made over the past 30, 40, 50 years. I'm curious, uh, and I know that USAID has uh, many programs devoted to helping communities around the world adapt to climate change in their own places uh, where they live. Um, but I'm curious how that squares with um, sort of the lack of leadership uh, from the US on an international scale to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, we know that folks in poverty are the most vulnerable. So I'd love to hear how the administration hopes to, uh, hopes to deal with the issue of climate change. Well, you are right that climate change is a shared responsibility and it disproportionately affects the most vulnerable people. It's one of the grave injustices that the people that actually contributed the least amount to the problem suffer the most from the consequences. 
And we see that every day when it is hotter and drier growing conditions that threaten crop output by almost 30% in rain-fed parts of Africa and Asia where people are most vulnerable from a food security perspective. And we see that through more erratic weather events that cause uh, all kinds of major natural disasters, in part like the floods we saw in Pakistan last summer that devastated the lives of 17 million people that were in that floodplain. And so we have been aggressive about taking a shared responsibility approach to addressing the challenge. We're now investing across the board in things like resilient crops and cropping systems, so systems that would allow for improved food production in, in, uh, in hotter and drier growing conditions. In countries like Indonesia, we have great public-private partnerships with the local private sector companies and leaders and the government. So everybody is contributing to a major deforestation effort. And at the end of the day, I think we believe across the board that the work in development has really changed over several decades. It used to be that the United States and the World Bank could get together and do big projects, and that was seen as success. Today, it's much, much more diverse. And there are great institutions like the private philanthropies in the United States, local entrepreneurs in Uganda and Indonesia, and civil society organizations in Latin America, they all should legitimately be part of these projects and solutions. And so our approach in climate change is really bringing those partners together and structuring partnerships that both stretch our dollars and to ensure that more people are working to help solve a problem that really requires that kind of partnership to address. Thank you. Um, there's a question that came in on Facebook uh, from Catherine Reeve. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, and I guess this is sort of for both of us. The first part of the question is, what approaches is the White House taking to eradicate poverty in the United States? And on what criteria is international aid being distributed to other countries? Um, on the domestic side, uh, we're doing a number of things, uh, predominantly through agencies like Housing and Urban Development. Uh, we've got uh, folks at the Department of Labor, for example, uh, just announced, a, I think it was a $14.7 million grant uh, to eradicate poverty, particularly employment for at-risk uh, young people uh, through organizations like Youth Build USA uh, who are federally funded partners kind of operating on the outside making sure that folks in urban and rural communities uh, don't fall into poverty and those that are in poverty uh, can get out of it uh, in, and, and I'm going to go back to an earlier question, in a self-sustainable manner. So uh, particularly with uh, job growth the way it is, wanting to make sure that there is a particular focus on urban and rural communities to make sure that the, those young people actually have an opportunity. Um, this actually ties in really well to your question, because when the president's making these un unprecedented investments uh, in wind and solar uh, and cleaner energy technologies, um, you know, trying to do what we can to make sure that there are success stories in these communities. There's a great one that I've heard recently. Uh, there was a Recovery Act grant that was uh, given to a Native Hawaiian community organization that was a for-profit, non-profit partnership. Uh, and Hawaii, for those that don't know, imports 100% of its energy. So uh, this group of young people are essentially retrofitting uh, Native Hawaiian homesteads, which are the equivalent of uh, Native American reservations, with solar water heating systems. And within 10 years, this $750,000 grant is scaled to be, I believe, a $50 million company that then is going to get to tackle all of these multi-million dollar homes around Hawaii uh, by employing Native Hawaiian youth that otherwise would have been at-risk populations. Um, so there are really creative ways that the administration is trying to tackle this, particularly given the fiscal concerns, to make sure that uh, in particular urban and rural Americans that are living in poverty uh, have some, some long-term uh, and short-term assistance. And kick it over to you for the international piece of that. Well, the international piece is very similar, except that this administration and President Obama has been very clear that we believe over time the best solution to poverty and extreme suffering is good governance coupled with economic growth in countries around the world. In fact, if you look at a map of the Korean Peninsula at night, you get a very stark impression of what we're talking about. You'll basically see South Korea all lit up with lights and a full electrical grid, really representing several decades of success in economic growth and ever improving and more transparent and accountable governance. South Korea used to be one of USAID's largest development partners. And today, they're self-sufficient. In fact, they're one of the donors uh, in development now. They're hosting the big annual meeting this year in Busan. North Korea, on the other hand, has gone the other route. And one sees darkness when you look at the, that part of the peninsula at night. And masked 
in that darkness and hiding in that darkness are some of the highest malnutrition rates for children in the world. Where nearly half of those kids are stunted, which means they're, they're smaller for age uh, because they have not had access to protein and appropriate nutrition. That will affect their growth their whole, and their ability to learn their whole life. Uh, and of course, we all know about the security threats posed by that level of poverty and ineffective uh, and autocratic governance. So we've made growth and governance the pillars of our work. And, and around the world, we're really focusing on partnerships with countries that are committed to that. But we've also said that there has to be real mutual accountability in aid. I think someone earlier said, uh, had a concern about just writing big checks to governments. You know, the days of doing that in foreign assistance are over. We now have to really demand accountability for the investments we make, and we have to ourselves behave in a way that demonstrates we are good partners. That's why in Tanzania, where we're working to help move people out of poverty and hunger, we've helped coordinate the entire international community. So the development banks, in this case the World Bank and African Development Bank, they'll build the road infrastructure in southern Tanzania. We will do the agriculture programs and reach the small-scale farmers, mostly women farmers that are in that area. A number of other donors have contributed differently to that area, and most important, we have the private sector making real investments in restructuring the port so they can get access to seed and fertilizer and export uh, products that are made in that area. And we've helped them, helped them sort of start agricultural businesses, small-scale agricultural businesses. That new approach and that new way of working should help 1.6 million people in, Tanzania, in that southern part of Tanzania move out of poverty and hunger in a sustainable way and a manner that over five, 10 years, our assistance will no longer be needed. And that's really the key to unlocking the power of human potential and reducing poverty and suffering. And this new way of working is something we're putting in place everywhere around the world and it's, it's very important. It'll be hard to do, but it's very important. Uh, this one comes from Twitter, uh, from at Emerging Issues. How is USAID engaging with youth to get them interested in global issues? It seems today that they are less civically engaged. Well, so I'll start by saying please go to USAID.gov uh, <laughs> forward slash youth impact. They told me to keep saying that over and over and over again. Uh, but the reality is we need young people and the energy young people represent. You know, we've just been through uh, a, a difficult budget times that persist here in Washington. And in order to be able to sustain this work and do it ever more efficiently and effectively, we need Americans, America's young people to bring their inventiveness and their commitment to global development. So you can go to the website and, and sign up to be a partner with us. But in a much broader context, we're now, we now have programs on universities and campuses modeled a little bit after the Blum Center at Berkeley or the Legatum Center at MIT. Those are institutions where groups of students can go out and work on development-related projects, come back and develop new solutions. I visited the laboratory at MIT and they showed me a water filter that uh, a woman had, a student had developed that was now helping you know, thousands of villagers in Bangladesh get access to clean and safe drinking water. Uh, all because they used their technical skill as an engineer to engineer something that was made of local materials, very low cost, and will help thousands of people uh, drink safe, clean drinking water. That's a wonderful accomplishment for a student. That's a wonderful accomplishment for anybody. And to be able to do that while you're in school and to be proud of that as a real contribution you've made to the world, uh, that's what we want to see more of from America's youth. And so we're committed to finding ways to connect you to our projects and programs in more than 90 countries around the world. And the starting point is, of course, the website. So thank you. Let's take one more from the audience here. Hang on one second, I'll get the microphone. Right up in the front. Hi, um, I work with the nonprofit Defenders of Wildlife and Care for HIV positive kids who are the law school parents and um, who know the organization we care for. And um, just like what you said, you want you to be active and then to go and start things and be motivated. Um, I went to, when I started out of college, I went there and started this nonprofit. But I noticed that with USAID in the past, I mean, it's been where um, a lot of funding or resources and those things, it's always gone to established 
organizations. Um, it can be discouraging, you know, when you know when you're when you're starting off and you're motivated and you want to do something, and um, there's not a lot of resources from the you know, USAID and other organizations to you know, motivate or to help out in that sense. And until this day, we haven't been active for now any good for um, six years now. We're seen as a very small nonprofit organization, so. To apply for even funding for you guys, um, it seems like I have to double or like triple our budgets or, or all these things to make it seem like we're doing so much more than what we are to even get qualified. Um, and I had seen recently that you guys were granting small grants to smaller organizations, but um, I've seen that it's still going to establish organizations even then. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you for raising the question. I don't miss a single opportunity to talk about procurement reform, uh, <laughs> which doesn't sound sexy and important, but it actually, in government, it's one of those things where you got to get your hands dirty and fix it in order to uh, make the, our government more accessible to Americans of all types in order to invite their participation more actively in, in development and, frankly, in every other aspect of public work. I, I would just say I came to this work from a position at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I often, even from that position, uh, thought that public institutions in development, big development banks and big development agencies, felt you know, you're very excited, you want to work with them, and then you just hit a wall because it's just so hard to navigate some of the processes that uh, are in place. And so we've introduced a major procurement reform. And the design of the procurement reform is to allow us to be more nimble and more uh, risk-taking and to partner with a broader range of development partners. I think today, the best development partners are often students in a laboratory or, uh, or a young entrepreneur in the country itself working to develop an innovative new solution to a problem that a lot of people think you just can't solve or you have to spend a lot of money to solve. And we didn't have the tools to work with those types of partners. Now we do. Now we have grant tools that allow people to work with us uh, without having to restructure their accounting system or become a big federal contractor to partner with us. We have new programs like the Development Innovation Venture Program and the Grand Challenges Program both of which are designed to allow for innovation grants uh, against really targeted and specific uh, challenges and problems that we're trying to address. And I'm very excited about where we're going in terms of our direction. But the proof will be in the pudding. And if we had this conversation in two or three years, you know, hopefully you would say, hey, you know what? You guys surprised us. It's like you're, you know, you're a big federal agency, but you're easy to work with for, our, for a small organization. And that's where we want to get to. We've seen some real progress already, especially in countries where we're working much, much more with local institutions and building real local capacity so that over time we can exit and we don't have to be there forever directly or with our partners. And uh, so I think this is, it doesn't sound really sexy, but it is the guts of what we need to get done and we're, we're working very hard on it. Great, thank you. We have a, a couple of questions that uh, are stemming from the concept of accountability again, and then also um, maybe surrounding the misnomer of mutually ex mutual exclusivity when it comes to funding. So I'll, I'll just read, read two of them. Um, Sigrid asks, how about more collage money, I assume we mean college money, uh, for young people in America, we give free education to others, um, why? And then Nicole uh, Theobald says, my name is Nicole from the Millennium Campus Network. My question is, how does USAID make the case for sustaining and or increasing effective foreign aid in the current economic climate? Well, you know, I think both of those questions uh, from Sigrid and Nicole both really do speak to the same point, which is why should we have foreign assistance at all when we're in very difficult budget times? And in fact, when you poll Americans, most Americans believe that we give 20% of our federal budget in foreign assistance. The reality is we give less than 1% in foreign assistance. And uh, the other reality is that this investment is probably the smartest, most efficient foreign policy-related investment we can make. 
Today, more and more of the fastest growing countries to which we export goods and services are in the developing world. And we create jobs through those exports. I was with the president in India, and we launched a partnership with India to develop new agricultural and irrigation technologies. The agricultural pump, the irrigation pump that we were helping to uh, help farmers purchase in India was powered by a solar panel made by a company named Suniba in Georgia, and I think now they've expanded and created 300 more jobs in Michigan. Those are the kinds of markets selling American inventions, in this case a very low cost solar panel, to a small scale, otherwise relatively impoverished farmer in India that smart foreign assistance can help bridge and create those economic opportunities. We also see the core value of this work for our national security. You know, General Petraeus, Secretary Gates has said that it is cheaper to do development than to send soldiers. And we see what happens when we cut relationships with countries and turn the blind eye and stop engaging with their people and their children. Uh, we see the results of that often decades later when military engagements are required to deal with failed or fragile states. Our food security program is in fact premised on the idea that it is cheaper and more efficient to build strong agricultural partnerships with countries as opposed to deal with famines or failed states or food riots on the other end of, uh, of negative outcomes. And, and then finally, the reason that I think we should do this work is it is a core expression of our basic moral values. And I actually got first exposed to development work. Before I went to med school, I worked on a health project in a village in South India. And I'll never forget walking into a one-room schoolhouse and seeing on top of this very small blackboard, you know, there are benches for the kids, no tables, no books, a little blackboard, a thatched hut, and on top of the blackboard they had four pictures, three of which were of Indian independence leaders, and one was of John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy. And it was a testament to the power of the Peace Corps and USA, both institutions that President Kennedy created. And in many ways, that's the way we want the world to see us and engage with us. We are, we are safer and more prosperous if that's the face of our engagement as opposed to having to deal with the military consequences of disengaging from the world. Let me add a little bit to Sigrid's question and a few others that we have about the investments that the administration's made in education here in the United States, because there, there are many of them that you all should be proud of since young people were really the driver advocating for them. Um, in K-12 education, there's uh, a lot of reform going on right now. And folks are taking a look at the Elementary and Secondary uh, Reauthorization Act, uh, which if you want more information on the Department of Education website, has a bunch right now. But the specific things that have already been tackled, there's about $3.4 billion that's been invested in STEM education, so that's science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, and most of it impacts K through 12 education. So equalizing the playing field for a lot of our young people that otherwise would not have had access to that. And what's important to note when we look at that and when folks say, well, is, is that a bloated expense or is that an actual investment? The president believes that's actually an investment, not just in educating folks, but in making us more competitive. So if you look at countries like uh, Germany, for instance, or China, who are making investments in clean battery technology or cleaner technologies, and then wondering why we uh, can't compete that way, a lot of times it's because uh, we don't have the same skill set when it comes to engineering. So making sure that we have those investments are going to propel us, you know, not just in the next 10 years, but 20, 30, 40 years down the line. And then on higher ed, there are three particular uh, really great accomplishments that young folks advocated for. Uh, the first was financial aid reform. Um, so there was uh, $60 billion that the president was able to free up uh, through financial aid reform that goes that used to go into the pockets of big banks. They would then mark up the money and loan it out um, to young people. He was able to get rid of that. So now we've got $60 billion or more that go into the pockets of roughly 8 million more young people that can access college. Uh, the other two components are Pell Grants, so folks that qualify for Pell Grants. Uh, the Pell Grant was raised uh, under this administration to $5,500, and something called the American Opportunity Tax Credit that uh, every young person gets to go to college. So uh, if you're a family that's got 10 brothers and sisters, uh, each of the 10 will result in a $2,500 tax credit uh, for your parents filing, uh, filing taxes there. Uh, the reason that I mention those particularly now, you know, that, uh, the White House and Congress are in the midst of a, a pretty sincere disagreement and, and uh, hopefully resolution on things like the budget, on the debt ceiling. 
Um, so it, it's all very relevant right now. The president's really trying to fight to keep a lot of these things that, uh, that affect young people on the successes that you all were, uh, were a part of getting. Um, so hopefully that clears up some of the domestic questions that folks like Mike Hamilton and others uh, had. Um, let me move on to a question that uh, Jimmy Martoon has, uh, which is about Haiti. Um, I know you've traveled there, you've worked closely with President Obama and President Clinton and Bush on this. Um, Haiti is one of the poorest nations in the world, and youth constitute a majority in the country. Um, if you are developing youth uh, and create strategies that are fighting poverty, uh, I guess that's how are we developing youth strategies that uh, create changes, fight poverty and global warming and so on. And what's USAID doing to plan for Haiti to help the nation empower themselves in the self-sustainable way? And just to add to that, how, how, are the, how are the poor people really being involved in the actual process of creation, of creating their own development initiatives and Finding leadership. Okay. So for folks who couldn't hear, how are young people actually empowering themselves with grassroots leadership? Is that yeah. right? Okay. Or, and how, how is USAID, what channels are being, are being opened um, so that poor people can participate more in this, in this development process, especially in Haiti? Okay. Well, it's a, it's a great question, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the question. You know, the earthquake in Haiti was uh, one of the most dramatic tragic events we've ever witnessed. More than 250,000 people died because of the earthquake overlapping with the poverty and the lack of building code and effective structures and, and just the lack of uh, effective management of the city services in Port-au-Prince. And coming out of that tragic event, President, Secretary Clinton, and others throughout this administration really made an extraordinary commitment to demonstrate that we would stand with the Haitian people. And we did in fact do that. We mounted the largest ever food distribution, reaching more than three million people within three weeks of the earthquake. We sent down the hospital ship, the USS Comfort, and supported health clinics all around the country and performed thousands of surgeries, saving little kids' limbs so that they could be more fulfilling lives over the course of time. We helped uh, distribute water and improve the course of water and sanitation, especially in and around Port-au-Prince. In fact, six months after the earthquake, the diarrheal disease rate in Port-au-Prince was 14% lower than it was the day before the earthquake because of some creative things that uh, our partners did with uh, truck drivers who were bringing in water from the D Dominican Republic and having them distribute chlorine tablets right at the point of water distribution so people could get access to clean and safe drinking water. But it's been very, very tough. There have been some challenges with removing rubble and, and issues like that. And there was a, a tough fought election uh, with a strong new leader and President Martelli that's now putting together a government that will have to take responsibility and accountability for Haiti's reconstruction. Our program there is designed to work very differently than in the past. Instead of trying to do everything everywhere, we're very focused on a handful of priorities such as the health sector and agriculture and economic growth and opportunity in particular for young people. We've helped work in a spirit of partnership with the private sector where we've worked with the Korean and American companies to create an industrial park in the north that will create 5,000 jobs and entire communities uh, will li live and gain access to education and services in that part of the country. We're working, we've already worked to more than double food production in certain parts of the country together with a partnership with Monsanto that's donated hybrid uh, seed varieties that farmers now have access to. And we've worked with the health sector to instead of having every NGO out there providing sort of services independently, to have a coordinated approach that has a single health system run and managed by the government and its private sector partners, but coordinated so that a patient at the distal point of care in a clinic, if they need to, can then get referred to mid-level hospitals and then the tertiary hospital in downtown Port-au-Prince if that's necessary. And these basic innovations may not sound like much, but they really represent doing things differently. And we'll hopefully see over the next sort of three or four years that that will have real impacts in helping Haiti build on a base of economic growth and improve transparency to get better results. Because you know, let's face it, a lot of people have spent a lot of resources in Haiti um, for a long time, and we still saw the tragic consequences of this earthquake.
and we have to just commit ourselves to doing things differently so that doesn't happen again. So I'm going to bundle a couple of questions here. Um, one of the first things that the president had done uh, was to create the Council on Women and Girls and put a focus particularly in the United States, in the United States on disparities uh, with women and girls here domestically. So um, you know, supporting things like the Lilly Let Better Fair Pay Act um, and, and, and a bunch of other investments, particularly in education. On the international side, there are a few questions from Kelly McAllis, Cynthia Carrion, uh, and Alexis Gordon, among others. How is USAID working uh, to empower people living in poverty, particularly maternal health, uh, bringing human rights to bear on ending preventable maternal deaths? And can USAID advocate for the passage of legislation that prioritizes and supports efforts to reduce maternal mortality, both domestically and internationally? And then the second question from Alexis that goes off of that uh, has to do with uh, how, you know, how can USAID ensure that all children, particularly girls, receive an education? Well, certainly the President and Secretary Clinton have made focusing on women and girls and gender a top priority for our agency for all of our development work uh, around the world. We see that whether it's in Afghanistan or Africa or Latin America, we are reprioritizing effective targeting of women and girls. And we do that really for two reasons. One is we know and the data show that you get better results when you do that. So if a woman earns a dollar of income in Bangladesh, there are tons of studies that demonstrate that dollar of income is more likely to get reinvested in the children and in the communities and in helping move those communities out of poverty rather than if that money goes to a man. So it's a little bit jarring when you read the data as a man for the first time, uh, but it is true and it's substantiated. And the second reason is we know that despite having all that data for years and years and years, development agencies and partners really haven't done as good a job as we should at getting this right. A lot of this is about the brass tacks of how you target communities and reach people when they're most vulnerable. In maternal health, I'm glad that came up because we've been doing a lot in that space. We launched a program called Saving Lives at Birth, which is an effort to address the 1.7 million women and children that die within the first 48 hours of life um, or die in, in or just after childbirth. A lot of the maternal death is from bleeding because women don't have access to a hospital or a doctor for, for birth. The reality is, you know, it's unlikely that we'll get many of those women into formal Western-style healthcare facilities. That's just not going to happen in southern Sudan anytime soon, where a woman is still more likely to die in childbirth than complete secondary education. I mean, think about that. And so instead, what we're doing is we're trying to get better services out to communities so women get a prenatal visit so that they have a, what's called a skilled attendant with them at birth. It doesn't have to be a doctor. It can be a, a nurse or a, or a mid-grade local, uh, local person who is trained to deal with childbirth and giving them better tools to help. We've worked with a company called Lairdal to create new resuscitation devices that are very, very low cost and can be used in a community setting to save newborn lives. And we've seen great results, little babies that survive because they have this plastic bag tied to this plastic uh, uh, mouth cap and, and they're able to be resuscitated. In the same way, we're getting better, better sort of technologies to women at childbirth, uh, ranging from new drugs and new uh, types of things that can be used to prevent bleeding and trying to test whether we can get that out to more women. So we're very focused on that. And what I was so excited about Saving Lives at Birth was we did a broad call for innovations and ideas. And we got in more than 600 proposals more than, which is the largest we've ever had to a major call for proposals. More than half of those proposals were from the developing world, and more than a quarter were from the private sector. And that, to me, is a signal of the enthusiasm that exists out there to tackle these, these types of problems and to really save these lives. And it keeps me motivated and inspired that we can do an ever better job. I think we have time for one more question that came in on Twitter, but there are a lot of folks uh, online here who are asking a lot of great domestic questions, and particularly the interaction uh, between uh, veterans groups, uh, employment, uh, energy, and the environment. So uh, I'm just going to do a quick plug for the youth website here that's going to include all of the stuff that Administrator Shaw is talking about. Uh, Whitehouse.gov slash Young Americans actually went live today um, and includes a place where you can sign up for our newsletter. And what I want to make sure we do is we've got a lot of great incoming suggestions, and I know folks in the room who, who have thoughts. 
We're going to stick around so that we can hear some of those. And if you have things you want to share, go to whitehouse.gov slash youngamericans. Um, if you sign up for our newsletter and also post things here on Facebook, we are going to be collecting them today. And we're going to do as best a job as possible to put together a blog post that addresses uh, some of the questions that you still have remaining. We only, we, we only had about 45 minutes today. And I, I also want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time, but definitely wanted to make that plug. And what was the agency-specific website? It's usa.gov forward slash youth impact. All right. Um, now, the, the last question here is from Twitter, uh, from uh, at, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, D-H-E-E-Y-A-N, -E -E D-H-E-E-Y-A-N. Uh, it says, there is innovation but lack of funds to uh, develop sustainable and efficient solutions to development. How can you help? Well, you know, I would say that's sometimes true, but, uh, but I would actually say that we, we actually live in a time now when we should think differently about how to solve these problems. It's not all going to be public funding for large-scale projects the way it was decades ago. And uh, we need to adapt the big public institutions, but so much of the solution set and the creativity is going to come from American universities coupled with counterparts ranging from Sudan to Somalia to uh, Guatemala, all three of which uh, have partners with, with USAID. I think what, we would, what I would just suggest is that whether you are uh, a technical person, if your skill is engineering, I think you have a lot to offer to global development, and we'd love to get you partnered with some of our partner organizations around the world that need engineers to create new tools for the very poor to lead better lives and to bring down the cost structure of doing this work so we can stretch our dollars and get more for the money we do have. If you're in medicine, we need you to do research projects that ask the question, how do we address maternal mortality, like we were just talking about, where hundreds of thousands of women die every year because they bleed after giving birth and they are not in a hospital. That's a solvable problem. And American medicine is the most inventive and creative medical system on the planet. We can help point a little bit of that energy towards this problem and address it. If you're in law or investment banking, we need your expertise on programs to help establish strong legal institutions, our work to help create a parliamentary system in places like Afghanistan and other parts of the world actually do help protect the interests and the rights of women and girls in otherwise very difficult environments. And you, with your legal expertise, have a lot to offer to that. So I would reframe the question a little bit. To me, it's less about public money solving these problems, and it's more about the technical expertise and the desire to make the world a better place that exists in all Americans. And I see our job at USAID and elsewhere as sort of uh, inviting in that partnership and creating the kinds of tools and platforms and connections to our programs and projects around the world so that you can, you can do something really great with your time and your energy and your skills. If we can get there, if we can build that together, uh, I don't think the funding constraint will be the major constraint anymore. And think, in fact, the biggest things that we've achieved in development over time, a green revolution that saved hundreds of millions of people in Asia, oral rehydration that saved tens of millions of kids in the 80s, our efforts to support democratic institutions in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union, those were probably not the costliest items. They were just the ones where we had the most partnership and creativity and technology all come together in the right way. So we'll keep working on the funding, but don't let that discourage you because we need your partnership and support. And speaking of partnership, uh, Jared was saying he wants us to do more of these. Uh, we are actually doing a whole bunch more on a number of topics throughout the summer. Um, that whole list is on whitehouse.gov slash young Americans. Uh, they include everything from domestic to foreign. Um, issue-based uh, and constituency-specific outreach as well. So if you're not getting these notices and you're joining us, you can sign up for the newsletter, whitehouse.gov slash Americans. And I'm going to give you a, a couple of suggestions because folks were asking for some more tangible things um, similar to what, what you were offering. Um, everyone wants to know how uh, you can be more helpful. And there have been tremendous things that young people have been responsible for the success of over the last two and a half years. Everything from don't ask, don't tell, to financial aid reform, um, investments in international aid and development, energy and the environment, 
Uh, and one of the ways that that really gets started is by young people partnering with each other, uh, writing op-eds, uh, applying for a lot of the grants that when we look at, it seems like only older folks apply for. Um, when we're looking at things like science, technology, engineering, and math grants, we've had a lot of artists who've expressed interest in applying for that, figuring out how do we actually innovate these engineers through the arts. So uh, being really innovative with, with your approach to that, writing those op-eds, partnering with us if you all think it's appropriate uh, to help get the word out. Um, and then really, I, I think realizing that um, one of the best things on the outreach side is when folks talk to others that disagree with us, uh, we really get a perspective of how we can actually achieve success and what that success looks like. I know the president talks about this quite a bit, that uh, particularly when we're advocates, uh, a lot of folks are very siloed, uh, you know, depending on our particular issue. But uh, of the top issues that young progressives and young evangelical Christian conservatives agreed on uh, included poverty, climate change, and Darfur among the top three. And we don't often think about that because we're so used to you know, watching MSNBC or Fox and people kind of yelling at each other. It makes fantastic television, but for young people whose stories aren't always told, it's really up to us to, to, uh, to make those stories told. So thank you all for being part of that. And sir, I don't know if you wanted to plug the website one more time, make some cool news. <laughs> uh, well, I'll always plug the website, <laughs> usa.gov forward slash youth impact. I, I guess just to close, I would say, I just came back a few weeks ago from Southern Sudan. And I met with a group of kids who were benefiting from the USAID Supported Education Program. And they were learning uh, English and some very basic math. And uh, they were in what they called the second standard. For us, it would have been, I think, first grade. And they ranged in their ages from maybe five years old or six years old all the way up to 13 or 14. Because so many kids there have lived through a period of violence and suffering and have not uh, had a chance to get even a basic education. And when you sit in that room with 10 or 12 of these young kids and you see American taxpayer money being used to provide uh, you know, education in a way that will help these kids lead much, much better lives and help contribute to the birth of a new nation, the 196th country in the world, uh, you get a sense for how important this work is. And so I thank you for your support. It's worth noting Southern Sudan will become an independent country on July 9th, just a couple of days from now. President Obama has worked very hard to make sure that that happens as a peaceful transition. And, uh, and it's just one example of what's possible when we bring our inventiveness and our commitment and our resources and our power to bear on behalf of the world's most vulnerable. So thank you for taking time for this, and thanks for having me. For those that want to share the video, if you go to the USAID website or the White House website, whitehouse.gov, uh, we are going to be posting a video of this along with a blog uh, that will probably be up in the next day or so. So you can look out for that uh, on both of our websites. Thanks so much for joining. Have a good afternoon, everyone.